So good morning, everybody. Um, I would like to welcome you and thank you to this uh, concluding webinar entitled Raising Awareness in SEM Employment. As you all know, um, this is a project which lasted three years. Um, Explora together with European Parliament partners in the field of STEAM. And RAISE stands for Raising Awareness and Interest in, in STEAM Employment. As you probably also know, this was co-funded by the Erasmus Plus program of the European Union, and it will be coming to a close in December. Um, the project was uh, coordinated by Esplora, and uh, from here I would like to congratulate um, all my colleagues who have worked on this project with the involvement of local and foreign participation, namely MCAST, SISA Media Lab in Italy, Glasgow Science Centre Scotland, um, Slovenia and Luxembourg Science Centre, and it received um, a very nice uh, sum of money, which I'm sure um, the figures will be mentioned later by our guest speakers. So together, the organizations worked to create, exchange, and pass best practices and creative approaches in the field of education. But before we start, I would like to have a look at the agenda so that everybody's aware of um, how this uh, seminar will be held. To start with, we have our honorary speakers um, who will be giving their keynote speeches. Further on, um, we will have a project overview by um, the project manager, Ms. Maria Farruja from Esplora. We will then have the launch of the project app, which is presented by MCAST, both by Chris Camilleri and Paul Police. Later on, we will also have um, the presentation of the education resource pack. It will be in the form of a workshop, and this will be presented by another colleague of ours, Ms. Erika Falzon. And further to that, we will move on onto a panel discussion. Um, which I will be introducing later um, the participants so that we can move on straight away um, with opening this webinar. The closing remarks will be held by um, Mr. Clayton Kutayar, who is our Esplora Deputy Director. So that's our agenda for today. Um, now I would like to welcome um, Dr. Uh, Jeffrey Pulicino Orlando. I would also like to welcome um, the Honorable Clayton Bartolo and the Honorable Stefan Strinzo for being here with us today and um, sharing their time with us and they will be um, initiating this webinar. To start with, I would like to introduce the Executive Chairman of the Malta Council for Science and Technology, Dr. Jeffrey Pulicino Orlando, to, to deliver his welcome speech in your good hands. Thank you, Giselle. Honorable Bartolo, Honorable Zrinza, Atsopardi, guests, colleagues, friends. It is with great pleasure that we're hosting the concluding webinar for the RAISE project, a three-year project with European partners in the field of STEAM. The Malta Council for Science and Technology recognizes the valuable measures and initiatives already being taken with respect to raising awareness on STEAM careers, both through formal and non-formal learning at a local, European and international level. We're pleased to have worked hand in hand with Glasgow Science Centre, Ljubljana Science Centre in Slovenia, Luxembourg Science Centre, the University of Trieste in Italy and MCAST to raise more awareness on employment opportunities in the field of STEAM. Although Maltese STEAM graduates are the most likely to be in employment in the EU, we still get worrying forecasts highlighting demands for human resources in our labour force in the foreseeable future. It is good to mention and note that according to education and training specialists who delved into the data to find out the current employment rates of recent graduates, Malta currently has the highest employment rates of recent graduates in Europe. It stands, it actually stands at 96.7%. 
This is closely followed by the Netherlands at 94.8, practically 95%, and Germany at 94%. There is still a significant gap between, uh, unfortunately, available STEM skill sets and the needs of our labor market. This gap in skills poses a threat to industries and economies all over the world and jeopardizes active citizenship and personal growth amongst citizens. Whilst most of the problem might lie in the shortage of people skilled in STEM industries, there is also a general shortage of soft skills which are related intrinsically to the sector. Uh, one can mention communication skills, critical thinking and management. Whilst it's good to note that looking for talent overseas is obviously a viable short-term solution, which many turn to, including our country, we feel that it is of the utmost importance to highlight the facts and raise awareness that our children might be missing a lot of valuable opportunities in STEM if they do not embark on STEM-related studies and careers. Students develop so the challenges that are, uh, have been identified are primarily the fact that students develop negative attitudes towards science as they move to, from their primary to secondary and later even at their post-secondary years of schooling. That is why awareness on STEM-related careers should start from a very young age. In line with this, studies also show that STEM engagements in primary years of schooling determine students' subject choices when they start their secondary schooling. Secondly, and notably, there is a decline in the number of students, particularly girls, who choose science subjects during their post-secondary years of schooling. Finally, there is a deficit in the number of teaching professionals who are skilled in STEM-related working sectors which are linked with our industrial sector. As a result of all these challenges, there is a dire need for a continued focus on high-quality STEAM education in compulsory schooling and through non-formal learning, including, but especially during, the early and the primary years. In conjunction with this, science career exhibitions and career awareness talks can also play a pivotal role in raising students' interest in taking up STEAM subjects and perhaps to one day even pursue a STEM career. In this respect, Esplora is committed to holding its annual National STEM Career Expo for late primary students to showcase local and European STEM careers and opportunities. We also organize several Family Science Days, which are held throughout the year to encourage families to meet and mingle with STEM professionals. We must be cognizant and appreciative of the fact that to tackle such shortfalls in STEAM employment, a holistic approach must be adopted. Both formal and non-formal education sectors have the potential to help in changing the perception and attitudes towards STEAM careers. In conclusion, it is with great pleasure and satisfaction that our team at Esplora, all of us, notes that between 2015, which is when Esplora opened its doors to the general public, to our visitors, and 2019, which is last year, an improvement of 14% was gauged in perceptions and attitudes of the Maltese public towards science and technology. This was highlighted through an independent survey, which MCST carried out through MISCO International. I'd like to conclude this very short intervention by thanking everyone uh, for all the work done in this project and to all those involved, uh, including our foreign partners. Over, back over to you, Giselle, this time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pulicino Orlando. Um, despite uh, the perhaps worrying um, shortage skills and gap, I'm very happy that um, you've pointed out um, that increase, 14% increase in the perception of uh, the Maltese population. Um, that is very encouraging and I hope um, through exercises like this and projects like this, we will continue together holistically, as you very well mentioned, 
to, um, to bring the appreciation of science forward um, to our local and foreign communities, science communities. So now um, I would like to introduce our second um, and also very important guest, um, the Honourable Clayton Bartolo, who is our Parliamentary Secretary for Financial Services and Digital Economy, to deliver his speech in your hands. Thank you. Thank you and good morning, Parliamentary Secretary Dr. Serene Dotto Pardi, Executive Chairman Dr. Patricia Orlando, colleagues, distinguished guests, and also friends. Today here we are celebrating Malta's alliance with European counterparts, marching us forward towards a knowledge-based economy. Allow me first of all to begin by remarking on the continuous hard work being done by the Malta Council for Science and Technology. I cannot stress enough the importance of the MCST for our country and also for our economy to move forward and build a dynamic society. And in fact, the MCST under the stewardship of Dr. Policino Orlando have shown continuous commitment to improve our country's capability in the fields of research and innovation. And for this, for all the hard work you are doing, I thank you. Notwithstanding the limitations brought by the pandemic, the MCST has been a proactive driving force in sustaining its commitment of being the government's main advisor in the fields of science and technology. And I certainly believe that raising awareness in STEAM employment, the RACE project, is another stepping stone in Malta's journey to increase its STEAM skills within the local workforce. It's high time that in this country, we really reward more research and innovation, not only by throwing money at and thinking that this will solve and give us solutions, but by providing education opportunities. And in fact, having a project like RAISE will address the skills mismatch and changes within the employment sector, which are truly encouraging. This project is designed in a manner because amongst its various output, time has been invested in the development of a new mobile application, thanks to also MCAST. Through this app, we can once again see the importance and relevance of the use of technology this time around on STEM careers. The app developed in this project can then be installed on the table for public to access from school or from the comfort of their own homes. It can also be utilized in science centers and at the University of the Applying Partner Countries using multimedia exhibits or technological devices. Malta's challenge in finding a good people with high value skills in the fields of science, engineering, healthcare, business and teaching is not an easy one. In fact, I believe that we must strive to do better. However, thanks to the endless hard work by MCST, among other stakeholders, we remain focused on bridging this skills gap by increasing skill supply in order to tackle expected skills, needs, bottlenecks, such as specialists, medical practitioners, and nurses in the health services sector, trained technicians in the fields of electronics, aviation, and also civil engineering, as well as software developers in the ICT sector and numerous scientists sector. It is purely wrong to blame parents, teaching practitioners, or students for the shortage of STEM graduates. We must be the change. In the face of this reality, we must all come together and continue addressing this shortfall. Hence, such projects will provide that well-needed boost to raise awareness on the different STEAM employment opportunities in Malta and on a European level using digital tools and technology. STEAM projects must be at the heart of a knowledge-based economy. We must take a step back, look at the bigger picture, and fully recognize that in a world that is getting digital every day, we must take bold decisions to move forward. We, as politicians and policymakers, have the responsibility of making sure that should a pandemic or an unexpected economic crisis reach our shores, Malta is ready to combat these asymmetric shocks and can, in fact, stand up. This needs to be done by building a digital economy based on emerging technologies complemented by a knowledge-based workforce. It is crucial that we put more effort to have more Maltese people embrace STEAM subjects. This is why I am fully confident that this Erasmus project will serve as an encouragement to 
to invest in more similar projects. And the future starts today. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for a very optimistic um, uh, speech there, Honorable Bartolo. Um, the future, um, as, as you, you said, is, is in, in your hands and in the hands of um, very important people who, without their support, um, this project wouldn't have been possible, which leads me on to introducing um, our next speaker, the Honorable Stefan Zrinzo Atsopardi, who is the Parliamentary Secretary for EU Funds, whom, without um, the sec Parliamentary Secretary's support, um, this project definitely wouldn't have materialized. So, so I would like to introduce Honorable Stefan Zrinzo at Top Party to deliver his speech. Thank you. Good morning, and first of all, um, I wish a good morning to, to my, my longtime friend, Jeffrey Policino Orlando, and my colleague, uh, Clayton Bartolo, and to all those who will be following um, this conference. I wish to thank you all for your sterling work and the opportunity that this morning we share our ideas about this very important subject. We are discussing the preparedness of our country, of our workforce for the changes that we are seeing on a constant basis and therefore we have to be prepared by training the the largest number of people in order to be able to seize the opportunities that the future will bring about. Raising awareness and interest in STEAM employment raise is a project that qualifies under key action two projects for strategic partnerships in the way that Explora joined MCAST and other scientific centers in Europe, particularly in Italy, Scotland, Slovenia, and Luxembourg. So this is definitely a positive um, action and way forward to see more collaboration between European partners. More than 400 and more 400,000 have been allocated to this project, which is co-financed with European funds from the Erasmus Plus program. The European Union is prioritizing digital transformation to make sure the continuous modernization of industry by digitizing its operation and the end products. Just this week, the European Union organized the fifth edition for the European Vocational Skills Week under the theme VET for Green and Digital Transitions. The aim of this week was to promote the development of vocational skills for people from different age groups so that these people and persons are prepared for the transition, transition to the digital economy. In fact, when one follows the discussion ongoing within the European Union, particularly with regard to resilience and recovery of the European economies, one constantly refers to the digital transition. But the digital transition does not occur simply by making claims and statements. It occurs with a concrete plan that needs a lot of trained persons and thus the importance of this initiative. The STEAM project is also aimed at this, these targets. The application that, is being, um, that, is, that has been launched will provide more information and education about vocational subjects in relation to STEAM covering science, information technology, engineering, the arts, and mathematics. Creating more awareness for more students to take up these subjects is of uh, great importance. With all these interventions and other, um, other plans that are being carried out, Malta is preparing its youth and industry by providing the necessary tools to facilitate the, transitional, the, the transition to a uh, digital economy. Uh, and we must ensure that this transition is as smooth and takes place in the shortest time possible in order to keep abreast with our counterparts and our partners within the European Union as well as the constant changes that are occurring. Preparation is key. Investment in our human resources, human resources is of paramount importance. The more we prepare youths and other workers to this change, the lesser the impact on our economy will be and our industry will find more prepared persons to take the
anything to seize the new opportunities. Thus, our appeal to the younger generation to participate, to train, to educate, and moreover, to see that we have all the necessary resources in order that we do not lose the opportunities that lie ahead. I wish you all a good morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Zrinzo Atsopwaili. Again, a very, very insightful speech there. And um, we do hope that we follow um, in these steps. I believe um, all of you will agree with me that um, this pandemic, pandemic has made us um, perhaps a little bit more aware and made us shift in our ways faster than we would have thought despite its uh, negative aspects. And yes, we do hope that um, through the efforts such as um, projects like Erasmus Plus and other efforts which were previously mentioned by Dr. Pulicino Orlando in terms of um, expos and um, other initiatives, we hope together, um, because we are in this together, to move forward for um, better careers in the STEAM field. I do thank you very much for being here with us today and for the time that you've shared with us. And uh, from here, uh, we will carry on now with our um, webinar. Thank you once again. So, um, in order to share with you um, the enormous work that went into this project, um, I would like to introduce um, another colleague of ours, um, Maria Farugia, who, is, uh, who works at Esplora, and she is um, an Erasmus Funds project manager here, who will be sharing with us um, an overview of um, this project. Um, I hope you will find uh, the contents interesting as much as we have when, while we were um, preparing for this webinar, and I would like to leave it in Maria's good hands. Thank you. Thank you, Giselle. Um, I would like to welcome you all to this webinar, and thank you for joining. Unfortunately, under these circumstances, we had to opt um, for an online version. Um, as previously, um, we already listened, and these were the project partners. So we've got um, Malta, together with Esploro, as well as MCAST, um, the United Kingdom, um, Glasgow Science Center, Sessa Media Lab from Italy, Luxembourg, and also Slovenia. Um, the project aimed at raising awareness about STEAM careers, specifically VET careers, to address skills shortages being observed in relation to labor market demands. I will be going through the intellectual outputs. So they were mainly five of them. As you can see, the activities we'll present, we will be presenting today um, the main intellectual outputs, which as you can see, um, we can see the application race careers. That's the, the, the app which the AMCAST um, developed and we'll go further into detail um, with our colleagues um, later on. Um, this will be accessed freely on phones and also tablets. This will be at uh, free use for schools, um, also for guidance teachers, um, and also um, in science centers such as ours and others relating to STEM. Um, Going through some training uh, modules, um, uh, they were there. There were the outputs of uh, going into development of a science communication training modules. They were uh, hosted in Trieste um, from Sista Media Lab, and uh, two representatives from every partner organization were invited to join in and get to know better. Um, techniques and methodologies that would ease science communication and eventually we can adapt them at our science centers. There was also a job shadowing uh, training event in Glasgow where also two representatives from every project partner were invited to get to know better and observe and also interact with um, the visitors as well to um, 
improve their expertise in science communication. Going through the Project Multiplier events, um, the National STEM Careers Expo, I will be going through some pictures um, from these. Um, so, um, uh, this was hosted at Esplora last January. It was very successful um, uh, with over 900 visitors being mostly primary school students and also uh, the general public and families most um, occurring in the weekends. Uh, various organizations such as the University of Malta, MCAS, other um, NGOs um, in STEM fields um, developed engaging activities um, for the students and the families that visited um, relating to the various roles that one can find in their organization and eventually the students might be interested in following this career. The launch event in Slovenia of the de-stereotyping stereotypes in STEM careers, this was a resource pack um, developed with the contribution from all project partners but um, uh, mainly compiled um, by Slovenia. Um, this launch was a test on the general public where uh, they had the opportunity to try the various activities. Uh, we will be going through this educational resource back with Erika later on in this webinar. Um, and for those of you interested, one can access all the activities online on our RAISE website. And also, for those interested, one can come at Esplora whenever they would like and pick a free copy from our reception. The Let's Talk Science, Science Communication Workshops. There were two of them, one in Malta and also another one in Luxembourg. There were various activities, workshop activities, such as the hands and brain on activity, gender in science communications, amongst others. The career cafes, these were held both in Malta and also in Slovenia. Uh, for Slovenia, they um, focused on two subjects, mainly the insight in the brain, caring for the healthy brain, and another career cafe, focusing on a very current subject relating to epidemics and other fears. And this was in collaboration with the University Medical Center of Ljubljana. The student careers in Malta which took, took place in October, um, had a, a different setting that um, being virtually. However, this proved to be still engaging and interactive for those participating schools. Thank you from my end. Thank you very much, Maria. Uh, we managed to get a sight of you there at the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. Um, lots of familiar faces there you've shared with us and maybe not so familiar, which shows um, uh, the European um, mixture of, of the project. Um, however, I would like to also thank, um, you take advantage of, uh, you know, of the presentation you've just given. I'd like to thank the National School Support Services who are um, instrumental in uh, bringing along students to the STEM Career Expo, um, which is very beneficial um, for those students who perhaps, you know, are looking into or looking into a career in the STEM field or in the STEAM field. And uh, perhaps, you know, um, it is not that easy to, to actually um, come across or be engaged with, um, with professionals or um, scientists or people in the field unless you are exposed to, to, to them. So we would like to thank them for their help. Um, this is a department within MEDE um, because it is only thanks to them that we managed to, to bring in um, uh, the number of students um, that we wished for. So, thanks again, once again, Maria. Um, now, um, we're going to move on, on to the more 
um, hands-on part, I, I would say, um, whereby um, our friends and colleagues from MCAST will be sharing with us um, the, the app which was, was developed. And this will be done by Chris Camilleri, who is a lecturer at MCAST, and Paul Police, who is a deputy director in the ICT um, department. So I will now leave it in their hands for them to share with us um, uh, this uh, beautiful um, resource which we now have to use in, in your good hands. Chris and so, Paul, thank you. Good morning everyone and uh, thank you Giselle for, for introducing GAMCOST. Uh, uh, Paul, I don't know whether we can share our presentation. Perfect. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. So in this brief presentation, Mr. Police and I will be giving an overview um, of the mobile lab that was developed as part of this project deliver deliverables. Uh, um, I will start by describing the app and the way the content is structured. And then my colleague, Mr. Police, will explain the technical um, aspect of, of the app. So if we go to the first slide, um, um, the first slide, as uh, you have already highlighted, includes some basic description of the app as laid down in the grant agreement. The output identification of this app is, is Output O2, and we started working on this app way back in 2017, and the work was concluded last, um, last September. Perhaps it was also important to point out, it is crucial to point out, uh, that this app was fully, almost fully developed by MCO students at the Institute of ICT under the direction of uh, um, Mr. Police. And uh, from here, I take this opportunity to, to thank the, the students, to thank Iris and, and also Ben for their um, hard work. Another important aspect is that the content of this app has been translated into a number of languages, including Maltese. And this was done not only because it is a criteria laid down in the grant agreement, but we wanted to disseminate this app as much as possible in various European countries. Perhaps if we go to the next slide. Uh -huh. so, so, as has already been highlighted in the introduction, the purpose of this app is to provide the users, the participants, uh, with information on STEAM career guidance. Ultimately, the final objective, not only of the app, but also of the project, uh, is to further encourage young students at primary level, at secondary level, to take up STEAM subjects and courses, which will ultimately lead them to a STEAM, um, to a STEAM career. And the next slide. <coughs> Thank you. Um, as an app, it can be um, downloaded freely, and this was done again to encourage the dissemination as much as possible. I think Mr. Police will explain in the, in the following slides, in the next slides, how this app um, can be downloaded free of charge. And uh, as already highlighted by Honorable Bartolo, um, this app can be practically used everywhere. It can be used in, in universities, in schools, in science centers, such as Esplora, um, and it can also be used by the general public from, from the comfort um, of, of their own home. If we go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, perhaps a small note before I will delve in more detail with regards to the content of the app, a small note on, on the contribution. Um, MCOST was responsible for developing, piloting, testing, and uh, ultimately launching the app. Uh, however, it is important to point out that all the partners in this project contributed significantly towards the successful implementation um, of the app. First of all, by providing their, um, their feedback on the content at the, at the transnational meeting and also as we went along with the implementation of the app. And also, more importantly, ultimately, to provide us with the translations so that this app can be um, disseminated as much as possible with the various uh, um, in the various European countries. 
um, in the next slide. Uh -huh. um, in the next slide, the, when it comes to the app content, it is important perhaps now to, to delve in more detail on, on the content and the structure of the app. The app content is structured in, the two, in two parts. In each part, the participant is presented with a number of Liker-based statements. So the participant is provided with a statement and he either fully agree, agree, disagree, or fully disagree with that um, particular statement. And the first batch of statements in section one is based on what is called as the Holland Code test, the Rysek test, which focused, as you can see in the diagram on the right hand side, it focused on six um, personality types. So according to the statements that the participant chooses, uh, the app will show, state whether the participant uh, is either realistic, is either investigative, artistic, social, um, enterprising, or has a conventional um, personality. Now, um, social and enterprising go beyond actually the objectives of Steam Career, but it was still decided to include them in, in, in the app. So based then on the participant selection in the first section, in the first part of the app, the app then goes on to the second part. So the app then provides the user with the next batch of statements, this time delving in more detail into the STEM careers. So if, for instance, the participant chooses realistic, okay, in the first part, realistic was subsequently uh, correlated with technology and engineering, and the participant then in the second part is asked a series of statements only focusing on technology and engineering. So he will be asked uh, and presented with a number of statements related to engineering, going into mechanical, electrical, marine engineering, all statements which this time, for example, for instance, will fall under the technology and engineering umbrella. Based then upon the student selection of statements, this time on, on, I'm speaking about the section two, about the second part, the participant is finally presented with a list of possible careers that he or she um, may consider. However, in order not to limit the choice of careers apart from the careers presented, the participant was also provided with a link with a button, okay, whereby he can, by pressing this button, he can browse and access explore a list, a database of careers related to that particular theme uh, which he or she um, chose. Okay, so, so basically that is it when it comes to, to the content, to the structure um, of, of the app. I think now I will leave it in the hands of, of Mr. Police to explain in more detail the, um, the technical aspect of, of the app. Thank you all. <coughs> Yes, thank you very much, Christian, for that very precise and detailed uh, description. Um, without further ado, I'm going to uh, introduce to you the application. I hope that the screen share is actually showing up the, um, the video. So to start off with, it's yes, it's, yes, it's coming. Yes, so um, without further ado, I'm going to explain, um, you know, the um, actual kind of flow, the, the, the flow of the actual application. So essentially, um, uh, when the, you know, when the user um, uh, loads the actual um, app, um, they are presented with this um, screen, all right? they would be allowed to change the options and obviously uh, you know they are allowed to uh, turn on and turn off music and effects and there is the multilingual choice over here i will be choosing english for the particular application so that you could um follow on um uh, just uh, it's just worth mentioning that as far as the game modes are concerned i would like to point out that there are two modes and i'm going to show them in this particular part of the footage so essentially when the user starts okay they have a 2d mode as well as an augmented reality mode okay we felt that there was the need to include a two-dimensional mode as well 
so as to maximize the accessibility of the applications. So obviously, um, as you might already know, there are high-end devices as well as low-end devices. And obviously, um, it would have made um, sense to access as much as possible of the market, all right? and uh, include a two-dimensional mode which would be more suitable um, for the uh, low-end devices such that obviously we maximize accessibility. Um, the users are then presented with a heads-up display which is over here. So as you can see from the screen share, um, you know, there are the various areas. Okay, so S, T, E, A and M are actually bars um, which show the uh, interest that the student or the user has uh, with regards to a particular area based on the answers that the uh, user offers, provides. And uh, the uh, once uh, the user starts selecting the options, um, these bars obviously will fluctuate according to the selections that the user makes. Um, uh, Obviously, this will work both on tablets as well as smartphones, so uh, everyone um, is able to use this. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that on the top right, all right, uh, the user can actually access the settings and also the audio um, uh, in terms of accessibility. Um, if you use the icon, which is on the top right, um, the app will actually read out the question for you um, to maximize accessibility as well. Um, uh, obviously, um, over here, as you can see, um, uh, there are a number of selections being done, um, depending on the um, the actual answers. I'm, you know, I'm going through this a bit quickly so that you can actually see. But over here, as you can see, based on the selections, so the selections would be, you know, users presented with a question. Uh, depending on whether they like, dislike, or feel neutral about the particular question that they're being pro proposed or statement, um, the bars will go up. And as you can see over here, um, the arts has risen, all right, based on the selections of the user, all right? Um, uh, once that the, um, the progress bar reaches till, till the end, um, essentially um, the user then moves on to the next section. And in this case, we are talking about arts. Now, in the second section, all right, the questions would be diverted further towards um, uh, sculpture, cinematography, and so on and so forth. Okay, because obviously these are um, five core areas that um, are related to arts. Okay, and uh, from here, as you can see, the choices have increased. They are not based on a like dislike type of um, uh, choice, but um, they are provided with further choices. And from here, based on what they chose, um, the bars once again start, start rising um, depending on the selection. Um, seems to be clear that um, over here, um, I was choosing you know, the, uh, the scores related to the first domain, so to speak. But obviously, as you can see, um, from there, then the user is presented with five core um, careers, all right, which are related to um, the particular choices that the user made. Um, I sped up the video, of course, so that, you know, so as to make things a little quicker. But then, obviously, they can share also their experience and they can actually um, uh, then explore the online database as well, which is um, a website which is uh, available separately. Um, needless to say that this database is updated um, periodically and it's um, available online. Um, uh, apart from that, um, there is also an augmented reality um, user interface related to this. I'm going to present it. Um, very quickly, and as you can see over here, the uh, the user calibrates and uses a marker. So when using the AR, the user would actually take a photo of a marker. So by a marker, I mean essentially something that the uh, camera, the mobile camera, can actually target. Okay, in this case, we use the student handbook, and the board 
turns into an augmented reality type of um, interface where uh, the user is obviously presented with the same set of um, types of questions and the same type of approach to the quiz, all right? Uh, with the only difference that it is um, uh, presented in augmented reality as a board and it can be um, utilized in the comfort of your home, of course. And uh, obviously it's a bit more interactive and uh, you know the user can actually then uh, experience the AR to have a bit more of an immersive experience. All right. Um, uh, needless to say that it was very laborious to, uh, to create something of the sort, but um, uh, I, I, I believe that in the end it, it created a very uh, immersive experience to the users. All right. Thank you very much. Um, as far as the availability of the app is concerned, we actually had a uh, Excuse me, because apparently the presentation. Essentially, um, there was a, a final. I, I, I hope that I am still online. Yes, okay, yes, um, at the moment, because apparently there was a trouble um, with, the, with the actual presentation. Well, that was so, that is um, is really good work. Huh? It's fantastic. It it me, it of, <laughs> yes, obviously. But the, the, the whole point is this, um, the, um, the app is available for download and it's available through the Google App Store and uh, doing a simple search, you know, for Google Play, I'm going to show you, you know, obviously how it can be done. Um, you can actually go to Google Play, all right, and from there you can shop for the um, uh, app over there. Okay, and search for raise careers. Okay, so essentially raise careers should show the actual um, the actual content. So here, I will choose. Um, you know, from here we need to choose the home. Essentially, instead of movies, you will choose uh, the all categories apps. Okay, so from here, once you choose apps and you choose raise careers okay um, you would be able to locate uh, instantly the uh, race careers app and from here you would be able to download it for your phones um, needless to say that the google play store on the mobile phone is much more um, accessible obviously so uh, but but in a nutshell that is how it's done all right apart from that i obviously created a qr code on the slides but unfortunately it got disconnected and um, you would have been able to see the QR code and it can be also accessible to that QR code. I will make this QR code available on the uh, MCST official website as well. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Thank uh, you. And I will leave it. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, that was, uh, Paul and, and Chris, that was really, really interesting. Um, so this means that uh, anybody can Load, um, this app. Uh, I think it's very beneficial as well for educators um, to help students get more engaged and more familiar with what type of um, careers are out there. Um, big well done for, for the work, especially um, the part of the, um, the augmentation part. I think that's also really exciting just to, you know, to see and that somebody has De developed this specifically and I do ask you to to um, to pass on the word you know with your colleagues friends I'm sure you know we can you know try to start using this and and hopefully start reaping um, the, the benefits of, of this app together of course with other initiatives that uh, we need to do um, all together and holistically as as mentioned in, in the beginning of, of this um, webinar so, um, so now we're going to move on onto another part of uh, the whereby we're going to um, discover the resource pack which was developed, and our colleague Erica uh, will be able to share this with us. In the meantime, um, if you do have any questions, um, please. 
um, you know, if you, you, you can chat with us and, and together maybe we can answer your questions that you have. Um, but for the time being, I will leave it in Erica's hands to be able to share this um, beautifully crafted resource pack um, that was developed thanks to this, thanks to this project. Erica. Thank you, Giselle. Hi, good morning, everyone. So as was mentioned by Maria, it's been a four year long project. Um, and we've developed quite a bit of activities for STEM professionals. So we had training ourselves and we also shared this training with STEM professionals. And we also try to create opportunities for them to participate. But that's just one part of the project. The second part of the project was creating activities and resources for kids to use. One of them was the app, being nowadays quite technological, we believed an app would be a right tool to use. Other, active, other resources included, included an open education resource pack, which was titled The Stereotyping Stereotypes. So since the project is focused on careers, one of the major issues that we needed to tackle was actually figuring out what stereotypes kids hold when you know they think about STEM careers. As most of you probably know, when kids are asked to draw a scientist, they draw a specific type of scientist, usually a white male person in a black coat in a lab somewhere. So the aim was to try and break that stereotype. All the partners, our lovely partners, were together. Primarily in the project application form, we had intended this to be in the form of an exhibition. We, we intended to take um, to meet with STEM professionals from various countries, get to know about them, get to know about their jobs, what skills they need, what inspired them, and then to create an exhibition, which could then be shared with schools, parents, kids, so that they could learn primarily that anyone can become a scientist and that scientists are all different. But also, um, the aim was to get them to meet, not meet, because automatically, you know, since it's an exhibition, you can't really meet them, but to get to know about modern STEM professionals without meaning to, maybe because there's more inf uh, information available online, we tend to focus a bit more on past scientists which research shows, especially if they go, for example, to a normal museum, uh, if you focus too much on past scientists, you can actually reinforce certain stereotypes because up until I believe around the 1850s, 1800s, female STEM professionals weren't really being recognized for their work or they weren't being allowed to. So it's very important that you give kids the opportunity to meet modern STEM professionals and to create modern role models. So rather than just simply doing the exhibition, after various discussions with our partners, who I believe I've seen someone here from Slovenia, yes, um, it was decided that we would also create a resource pack with hands-on activities so that apart from having a list of STEM professionals and their narratives, we'd also have a range of hands-on activities which they can do. To start, before going into too much detail, because I'm pretty sure that you might be a bit tired of listening to everyone speak by now, we want, I'd like to really do an activity with you. I'm usually quite a face-to-face -face kind of person, so this is gonna be a challenge today, and I hope that you actually participate in this. One of the activities that we do with kids is to read out a number of statements related to stereotypes. Usually we get them to, we, we stick up um, strongly agree, disagree, and strongly disagree. I said strongly agree, agree, disagree, and strongly disagree on the walls. We read out a statement and we get the kids to actually move around the room depending on whether or not they agree or not with the statement. This helps us to see visually as well and it helps them to see what kind of beliefs they hold in terms of some careers and some subjects. And after discussion, because in, in this case, we don't want to get them to a particular answer. We just want to discuss why they think about certain things the way that they think. After discussing, we give them the opportunity to either stick with their choice or they have the ability to actually change their position. 
because at the end of the day, the more we learn about a specific topic, um, we're able to change our decisions and take a maybe more informed decision. Given that we're online, um, we decided that it might be a, a good opportunity to try and use the poll in Zoom. So this is how it's going to work, hopefully. If not, don't worry, I'll just go to the resource pack, but we're going to try. Uh, there are two ways how you can participate in this. A poll question will come up on your screen, hopefully, and you will be asked to vote whether you agree or disagree with the statement. Now, after you vote, we're going to share the results. And I am going to ask you to give me a reason of why you voted the way you voted. I'm hoping that we're going to have some volunteers. Please put yourself, yourselves in my shoes. I'm, I, I'm sure you would have wanted people to volunteer. And you can do so in two ways. Either chat, I'll leave your answer in the chat. I have my chat box open so I can read it easily. Or the second option is, if you don't mind interacting with me face to face, is raise your hand. So you should have an option somewhere on your screen to raise your hand. If you raise your hand, our IT person will swap you from being an attendee to a panelist. And for those few seconds whilst you're telling me why you voted the way you voted, you'll become one of us on the screen and will be able to interact. So I hope to see some faces. If not, please at least type in the chat. Okay, so I'm hoping that everyone understood. Usually I get the kids to do this on screen, but I can't make you do this either. So, Matthias, shall we start with the first question? All right, yeah, it works, you see? Mela, we have question one. Young children are too young to notice stereotypes. We need to focus on adolescence. What do you think about this? Again, I don't really care about the right or wrong answer. I just care about what you think. Do you agree with the statement? Do you strongly disagree? As you can see, we don't give kids the neutral option because I strongly believe that everyone has an opinion. You can't be neutral about something, so you have to choose something. We're gonna give a few seconds until you vote, and then Matthias will close the, the voting and we'll share the results. So get clicking. Okay, we're gonna wait a minute. COVID has really, you know, made it challenging for <laughs> these type of activities, but we're learning and hopefully we'll get better at them. Okay, let's see. So we have, young children are too young to notice stereotypes. We need to focus on adolescents. We have a lot of people who disagree and strongly disagree, but we have 5% who agree. So in this case, since the majority is disagree, I'd like to start off by asking, if someone will volunteer, if someone agreed to the statement, can you tell us why you think that you that we should focus on adolescents? If I don't receive an answer, it's fine, I'll move on to the disagree. So whoever agreed with the statement, can you share with us why you agree with the statement? Either put your hand up or else in the chat, press write down why you think so. In the meantime, Whoever disagreed with the statement, if you can also give me a reason as to why you think that we should also focus on young kids, that would be greatly appreciated. So let's see if this works. I'll give it a few seconds just in case you need to write things down. If not, we'll move on to the next questions. Okay, so we have Lorraine from the panelists. By the way, Lorraine, you can speak because you're already on screen, so feel free to speak. Hi. Hi. Hello, Erica. Hello, everyone. Um, I particularly agree with the need to keep on focusing. It's not that I don't agree with the fact that children are, young children are too young. They do notice stereotypes. Um, the thing is, we have to focus on adolescents because they would be um, at, a, at a later stage rather than childhood where their aims and ideas Start clarifying. Obviously, I'm seeing this from the perception of an educator and, and the career guidance initiatives which we hold with students. Um, because when they are young, they tend to, to live fairy tales, fascinate themselves about everything practically. 
So if a, if a young boy says something, he wants to become an astronaut, um, practically an educator, uh, it would be crude to, to spoil his idea about his, his intention, his, his future career aspiration. But as an adolescent, yes, we can focus a lot with, with, with adolescents because um, they have more clear ideas, they have their, their, we probe into their perceptions, we challenge their perceptions, this is the thing which we would be tackling later on. So yes, that is why I agree, because I believe that uh, adolescence strikes the right balance between leaving them to aspire for any career, particularly within STEM careers, um, aspire towards any career which they want, even if at times that career aspiration might seem limited, as I just mentioned the example of astronauts, for example. But on the other hand, uh, adolescence is the right time to start discussing with the adolescent himself or herself uh, so that you elicit that picture and you make them develop their interest further. Or else you make them realize that not everything, for example, works. But practically, yes, that's why I mentioned that I agree, because it is uh, the right balance where we have to focus and discuss further, practically even individually, with each adolescent in this regard. Fair enough, fair enough. We have a lot of people who disagree. Actually, let's see a bit. I thank you guys, everyone. Mela, so we have Marika, who said that she disagrees because from a young age, children show that they want to play with specific toys. For example, girls um, play with dolls, boys play with cars. We also see this in stores. If you go in a store, you see the pink section, the, the blue section, and then you try to find the neutral section. So, fair enough. And uh, yes. Then we also have um, Sister Matlin, who says, I'm sorry if I said your name wrong, um, that they notice stereotypes from a very young age. Uh, and she sees it every day in class, especially with simple things such as colors. Most boys completely eliminate pink and purple colors as these are more perceived as feminine colors, apart from other things such as toys, emotions, etc. Fair enough as well. And Tanya also strongly disagrees because they are indirectly absorbing all the messages around them, being whether they're placed there by I'm assuming even the adults or marketing companies, etc., consciously or unconsciously. And also that if, according to Rene, and in this case, yes, it's also true, if children um, gain certain beliefs about stereotypes from a very young age, the older they get, the more difficult it is to debunk them and to actually change them around. So as we can see, um, a lot of people think that, yes, you need to start from a very young age because they start developing stereotyping beliefs from a very young age, but it's also important to focus on the adolescents, especially since they're at that age. They're also in the self, not self-critical, but it is the age where we tend to start doubting everything that we do and we start forming a bit better our self-identity. So in this case, I agree with all of you that, yes, we should focus on ideally everything from what we found out as well i I'm, i tend to agree with with tanya paolo and andre and etc because we found that since they can, kids can start developing stereotyping beliefs from as young as two years old mm -hmm. usually three but even two years old so in fact for the resource pack we decided that apart from actually doing activities for teenagers we also provided activities for young kids to catch them young. Um, we believe it's important that way we'll be covering all the age ranges and we won't be leaving everything, anything, anyone out. And also hopefully we'll get to, as Irene said, um, we'll find these stereotypes from a very young age and hopefully not allow them to develop, which I know is an idealistic point of view. Erica. But, you know, yes. Um, if I may, as a non-educator uh, myself, yes, yes. Um, I uh, also participated and I said strongly disagree. Um, okay. I am surrounded by my nephews and nieces who are at a very young age. And I, um, from just observing, um, 
they're very young, um, five, three, and one. Maybe the one-year-old is perhaps too young to, for us to notice as adults. Um, but I believe um, that further work must be done, not only um, in terms, because you could have very good educators, um, as Lorraine uh, mentioned, and as um, Irene, everybody is a, you know, you start tackling de-stereotyping at a young age, but then, unfortunately, perhaps the environment that they're surrounded with outside of the, the classroom or outside of the science center, they're constantly bombarded with these messages. And I consider myself, hopefully, to be um, a little bit more um, open-minded when it comes to, to stereotypes, thanks to the science center I work for and, you know, um, whatever I've collected along my journey. And I do find myself um, trying to communicate with my nephews and my nieces and communicate normally, you know, um, as sister mentioned, the colors, for example. But then there will be conflicting ideas coming from elsewhere. So um, perhaps my suggestion is to um, carry on doing this fantastic work and uh, hopefully um, extend it further to, to our guardians, to um, outside of you know, the education world. And thanks to these initiatives, science centers, etc., maybe TV programs, um, whatever channels that we have, um, to start um, making this shift, this shift that needs to happen on a national and on perhaps an international level. Um, I know Malta is quite forward in certain aspects, but kids are like a sponge, you know. Um, they, they do, you know, they do, as, as you mentioned, they like fairy tales, they like to be astronauts, they like to be this, this and that. And, and they do absorb, especially um, really fast. And then it's, as Irene mentioned as well, um, the more ingrained it becomes in them, then the harder it is to uncover um, these layers. So, um, yes, great work. And uh, my suggestion is to extend other projects to come. Definitely. In fact, we were just discussing it, I believe, last week. So in the, in the project, we had quite a number of target groups. So we had the STEM professionals, we had the educators, we had the kids, we had the science center employees, and those were the parents. In terms of the parents, what we've done up till now is um, the events. The plan is, after we've done virtual events as well, we saw how, not easy, but we saw how um, maybe a bit more accessible it can be for parents. And we've, we've been discussing whether in the future it would be possible to hold similar virtual events until you know the pandemic is over and um, to make it a bit more accessible for parents to also be aware of certain things because as you rightly said unfortunately you're bombarded by these stereotypes wherever you go we're adults we're a bit more aware of what's happening around us you'd be amazed at certain um, beliefs that kids hold and um, so the idea is that if we at least work with educators, educators can, can also share their experiences and we can share our experiences and also work with parents, at least we would have covered two major, you know, target groups. And then, I mean, you can't control what other marketing companies do and what they, how they try to sell their product and services. But, you know, hopefully in the future, we'll, there will be more awareness. And if kids are more aware about what they can and cannot do, in this case, we're telling them that you can do everything, and then hopefully they won't be as influenced by by outside sources. But I think it's a bit unrealistic to expect that, especially given social media nowadays. But you know, all we can do is to try and keep on pushing for for more awareness. So, in I'd like to do another question. Um, I'm speaking with my IT person to see whether I can choose one particular question. Mela, if you could give me one minute, I will number my questions and I can give him the exact number of the question because I planned quite a bit of questions. I didn't know that we were actually going to take such a good discussion, make such a good discussion. So, um, Matthias, could you share with us question 12, please? 
So there is a statement. Girls are as good as boys at math. It's an unbiased statement. What do you think about this? Do you agree with the statement or not? In the meantime, whoever would like to um, share their opinion, you can start writing it in the chat, unless you want to you know, become a panelist and speak to me. Okay, hopefully by now everyone has voted. Okay, so let's see. Yay, oh lalo. This is a very dancer. Okay, so let's let's get a few um comments from people. So why do you strongly agree? Why do you agree? Why do you disagree? Why do you strongly disagree? I'm curious. So obviously, given that you're all adults and uh, uh, you're a bit more aware of these things, I changed a bit the questions. Usually we don't ask these type of questions to kids. We usually ask them questions such as boys and girls are both good at, no, not like that. But for example, enough, girls are better at nursing because they are nicer, because they care more about people. And there will be kids who, you know, their ideas are quite different, which slightly change the wording to adapt it to you guys. So do we have any shares? Anyone who would like to share? If not, I'm going to go to the panelists. Someone has to share. So we have Tessa. Thank you, Tessa. Good morning. I chose strongly disagree as boys have, have been set as a standard that girls are being compared to. Fair enough. What else? Anyone else? Rebecca, I chose strongly disagree for the same reason as Tessa. Thank you, Rebecca. So who agreed that it's an unbiased statement? Saying girls are as good as boys implies that boys have an intrinsically good are, are intrinsically good at maths. Agree with Tessa. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Silvana. So, anyone who agreed with the statement, would you like to share? Perhaps Erica. Yes. Perhaps if I may um, put in a comment, I think that uh, the thirty-two percent agreed because at least this statement seems might seem unbiased because you are putting both genders at the same playing field. Starting off from there is already a good start because usually we are used exactly. to biased statements. Exactly. So, that is why, because it, it's either seeing it from the statement itself perspective, girls are as good as boys. And, and then there's the thing about unbiased or biased statement. It depends on exactly. um, the perception that one has with regards to when reading the statement itself. But that's why most of us perhaps agreed and even strongly agreed, I should say, because at least we have both genders on the same page. Exactly. At face value, in fact, that's why I included this, this statement. So at face value, it might seem like an unbiased statement. I will admit, first time I read it, I also thought it was unbiased because I didn't actually read it carefully as other people are doing, such as this and Rebecca. But I've been reading quite a bit about language and stereotypes lately and about how we can un unconsciously uh, like propagate the idea that certain a particular gender is naturally better at doing something by then using comparison. So in this case, we're saying girls are as good as boys at math, which, as someone rightly said, as Silvana rightly said, it's implying that boys are naturally good at math and girls can be as good as them. But it doesn't mean that both boys and girls are naturally good at maths. So 
even though we not, might not be aware of it, including myself, we need to be very, very careful about how we speak. And as much as possible, whenever we're referring to genders and their abilities in STEM, we don't compare. So ideally we say all children are good at maths, for example, or, or boys and girls are both good at maths. That way you're putting them on the same level instead of trying to compare girls with boys or vice versa, comparing boys with girls. So just to be a bit careful in terms of what language we use and don't use in our everyday life, which again, I know is very difficult because I tend to do it myself. Um, so I don't know how we are with time. We have other statements, but in this case, I can just go to the resource, but other statements usually refer to, we saw what we have in Malt especially. So we have the idea that people who work in IT usually work alone or that people who study science are antisocial, that they don't like going out, they don't go to parties. So as much as possible, we try to pick statements that we would get uh, different answers from the kids. Um, we also tackle things such as having girls specifically good at certain subjects, boys specifically good at other subjects because of maybe stereotypical emotions that are usually um, quite, as, because usually you say, for example, that boys are a bit more logical, girls are, girls are a bit more emotional. So automatically, they assume that boys are going to be better at certain jobs, girls are going to be better at other jobs. We try to discuss these in, in the workshop, especially when we have adolescents such as the um, career orientation visits. We try to make it a point that we carry out the discussion simply because we realize as well that sometimes we might not have time for this I in class, not because the educators don't want to do it, but because obviously they're always pressed for time. So at least we say that the hour that we have here, we can at least um, take up most of the time discussing these issues. And it's amazing how many stereotypes <laughs> Stereotyping beliefs the kids have. I'm not sure what that should we do one more question just for fun. I enjoy these by the way, so and the fact that we're doing it on Zoom is like amazing because I I was so worried about this. Now let's let's do one more question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um Matthias, can you show us question number five, please? Creativity is not as important for STEM careers as it is for artistic careers. What do you think? Okay, we'll give it a few more minutes. In the mean uh, seconds. In the meantime, um please feel free to comment in the chat so that as soon as we share the results, we'll be able to see. So do you agree that creativity is not as important? Again, we have a comparison here. Or do you disagree that creativity is important for both careers in STEM, but also for maybe artistic careers, such as being a dancer and, and, and being a musician? What do you think? Okay, let's see. Okay, so it's like we have a unanimous decision, which is amazing, that disagree. So everyone disagrees or strongly disagrees to the statement, which means that everyone views creativity as important for STEM careers as they do for artistic careers. As you might imagine, unless they're being um, exposed to, 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 to activities which require their creativity, kids might believe that, in fact, the other way around, that creativity is not as important in STEM careers. Most people we speak to when they work in the industry or as educators, creativity is crucial, especially if you either want to solve a problem, create a, pro create a product, um, if you're an educator and you need to do a lesson, you need to be creative. If you're not creative, you're not going to be as successful and you're not going to have as much influence on kids. So again, another important thing, the skill of creativity is extremely important in all jobs. 
So thank you, thank you. We have Justin. He strongly disagrees as arts are intrinsic part of STEM. Exactly. And in our case, for example, I can speak on behalf of Explore in this case. We're using the arts to try and attract people who might be a bit, uh, you know, be afraid of science because they think that science is extremely difficult, but they might like the arts. So if you can teach um, or e explore the, the Newton's laws of motion through a dance, why not? As long as we're exposing them to STEM, it's amazing. And art is a great way of bridging, bridging that gap. So thank you, Mattia. So we're gonna close this question. Now, um, we're going to go really quickly through the resource pack. Mala, let me share my screen. Hopefully you'll be able to see it. Mala, share. Mala. I'm also going to be closing the chat in the meantime. So if I don't see any comments, I'll answer later. Tom. Mala. Thank you all for participating, by the way. You exceeded my expectations. Mela, as we already discussed, the, the open education resource was primarily meant to be a set of profiles of modern STEM professionals and it was meant to be used as an exhibition. Apart from that, we decided to design a couple of activities. By a couple, I mean 12. And each activity sometimes contains multiple activities in it, which was fun to do. So the, the resource pack can be downloaded from the website and you can also get a copy from Explora, as Mario already mentioned. Um, and I'll also show you how you can get to it on the website later on. Now, let's go a bit through the resource pack. Profiles. So each and every part of the organization was requested to find STEM professionals which who, who work in the STEM industry or academia and who ideally work in a VAT career, simply because obviously we're being funded through a VAT um, part of Erasmus+. Plus. In our case, we tried to see, every country had to do this, we, every country had to see what stereotypes each country had and maybe try and feature people who broke that stereotype. So in the case of Malta, unfortunately, as MCAS will probably um, tell you at some point or another as well, a lot of males are in the IT industry, not because females are incapable of being in the same industry, but sometimes they believe that either they, they shouldn't I've actually heard someone, I, I've been trying to remember who said it. I'm not sure if it was someone I know or an, an acquaintance or a friend, but someone told me, males are just naturally better at IT. So why should we keep trying to push females into IT? In that case, you know, you can just imagine my, my reaction, but this is why we're doing this. So we try to feature people who would not normally be associated with the job. For example, in the case of a doctor in Malta, when we think of a doctor, it's tabib. As automatically, that's another thing that we, we tend to say, language, it's tabib. We rarely say it's tabiba. Um, we featured a young doctor who's actually a female to try and break that stereotype that doctors are always middle-aged white men. Um, in terms of teachers, we tend to think of teachers as female. In this case, we, we showcased a, a dear friend of mine who's a male teacher and who's, who's also considered to be quite cool at, at his school because he actually plays and he drives a motorcycle. So we try to, you know, <laughs> milk that. Um, in terms of aviation, we chose a female engineer simply because there aren't a lot. In fact, in her case, when we were working with Michaela Rosa, she was, I believe, only one of two females on her team. The rest were all male. It's amazing as well, I've mentioned IT before, how difficult it is to try and find someone who works in IT and is a female. I spoke to an, an, a, a person who I used to go to, to post-secondary school with, 
and she said that she's only one in two in a whole team of men. So only two females, and then there's a whole floor filled with men. And she also told me, I'd rather not participate in the resource pack simply because I don't think I'm going to stay in this career. So we need to be a bit more aware that unfortunately, without um, maybe wanting to, the fact that you are in a, in a group of just men, you sometimes maybe not feel too comfortable staying there because you might not think of yourself as being capable. Again, we have a lot of stories of these things. I had an ex-colleague of mine who had to leave her job for the same reason. A friend of mine left her uh, aviation course simply because she was the only female in a group of male. An ex-friend of mine as, as well, she left engineering because she was the only female in a class full of boys. So as much as possible, same reason as before, if we try and catch them as young as possible and keep at it throughout their whole education, compulsory education, we might at least try and get more females into specific jobs and more males in other jobs which are female dominated. In this case as well, we also showcase, for example, Daniel Manjon. He's a, he's a master's student. He's amazing, this guy. Uh, he participates in all other events because he loves speaking with kids. He's a biologist and usually we associate biologists with being female. In this case, he really does not look like a normal biologist. He's full of tattoos, he has long hair, he's, he's quirky, he, he is not what you would typically assume to be a biology researcher. And Hand is a chemistry lecturer and researcher who, we, uh, who came to explore with her kids and we were just speaking to her and she's amazing. So she has, I believe, four kids and she lectures and she's doing a PhD. And she was so inspirational. We were like, can you please participate in our resource pack? We really like people to be aware that, again, people of all genders, color, race, ethnicity, anyone can study science, anyone can succeed at science. And by science, I mean STEM, obviously. So the first part of the resource pack consists of these profiles. They're mostly targeted towards teachers so that they can be a bit more aware of modern STEM professionals and use them as examples in class. In my case, I graduated as a physics teacher and I have no experience with working in the industry. My only experience has been these past five years speaking with people who work in academia and in the industry and learning about what they do. So we felt that providing educators with such profiles would help them realize maybe what skills are needed for particular jobs and also um, be able to use them as role models in class. We hope that educators would find this useful. Personally, I think if I were an educator, I would find it useful simply because I had no experience in the industry. In the future, we hope to bring industry professionals together with educators so that they will realize um, what each job entails and how they can help each other inspire more kids. But that is a plan for the future, which we still have to work on. What else? So apart from the narratives, which are these, so the profiles are, as you can see, are quite detailed. They include profiles from all five participating countries. Um, and they tackle questions such as, what is your job? What skills do you need? What inspired you? Something fun about yourself, something quirky, your favorite food, something which humanizes STEM professionals. They are not up here and we can't speak to them. They are humans just like you and I. Then following the narratives, we also have activities. So the activities, are quite varied. We have activities for kids from as young as four to as old as 18, simply because since MCUST are a partner with us, we want to actually use these activities. As science centers, usually we deal with kids who are quite young in age. So in terms of MCUST, to be able to use these activities, we decided it would, might be best for them to develop activities which are meant for 16 to 18 year olds. That way, everyone would be able to apply these activities in class or else in the science center. So 
we have 12 activities ranging in age and some of the activities have more sub activities included in them. I'll show you on the website. The first thing you can download is the whole resource pack where you can find the profile and activities shown as you see here. You'll see the aims of the activity, a summary of it, resources that you need, the age, and if you have further resources um, linked to this particular activity, for example, as you see for STEAM, you have the overview here, but then you have links, which will take you to other resources related to the activity. So you'll find one of these for every activity. You'll also find more detailed um, workshop plans on some of the activities. In this case, I decided to use um, an activity from Luxembourg Science Center. They created a game called Four Steam. Apparently, it follows, um, it copies a bit the idea of a quartet game. I've personally never played it, but I've played this game. So basically, you have a set of cards which showcase a particular STEM professional from Luxembourg, and they've written down what hard skills and soft skills you need for that particular job. So in the case of Alex, for example, he's doing a PhD in physics, and there are questions, oh, there are skills beneath, as you can see here in purple and, and yellow, hard skills and soft skills required for his job. The aim of the game is to have a set of these cards. The kids have to pick a skill, for example, the skill of creativity, which in his case is a five. And then other kids have to look at their cards and say the number that creativity is on. So is creativity high on their list? Whoever has the highest number takes all the cards. Indirect in this way, they're being exposed to different jobs they're being exposed to different skills and also what skills are most important in, in particular jobs because automatically kids want to win. So they're going to be choosing the skills which are most needed in their particular profile. To help um, educators and science center, prof uh, science communicators use it in science centers, they've given, it, they've given us uh, a detailed profile of the same professionals that are featured in the, in the cards, and they've also provided us with a template. So in our case, in the case of Malta, rather than using Luxembourg's cards, we can use their template and create our own four STEAM cards featuring Maltese STEM professionals or local STEM professionals rather than Maltese, because we didn't just want to focus on Maltese, it was another aspect. We wanted to focus on local. You can have some professionals in Malta who are not local, uh, uh, who are not Maltese. And that uh, helps us show kids that if they study STEM, they don't necessarily have to stay in Malta. Like we're, we're in the EU now. They can go wherever they want and take up any opportunity. And same thing with other EU nationals. They can come here at any time and work here. It's good to have this, this form of, you know, um, globalization going on and it's good to make them aware because when I was still young I believe that it, I couldn't take up particular jobs I wanted to become a vet because I had to go and live abroad or I had to go on something abroad and for me that was a really big thing so it's good to show them that it's not it's possible and just be determined and do whatever you want so that is how the activities are planned out and and they're all downloadable. As I said before, most of the activities are adaptable. In this case, for example, for STEAM, it's adaptable. We also have uh, activities for the young kids. We have, um, from Glasgow Science Center, they created this really sweet book called Robin and the Robin. Robin is actually a scientist that they often work with um, Glasgow Science Center. It's, they created an illustrated book. Um, and apart from the book, they also, have an activity connected to the book where you show certain photos and you ask the kids questions such as, do you think the person in the photo is a scientist? Or, and if they say no, then they can say, why do you think it's not a scientist? Or if yes, why do you think it's a scientist? Again, to try and break the state that scientists are just people in lab coats in labs. 
We also have um, stories written by a colleague of mine, um, Sara, who, uh, which feature for Maltese STEM professionals. As you can see down here, we have an illustration of one of the STEM professionals. Uh, apart from the story, the short story, we also have a set of activities which are directly linked with that particular profession. So in this case, they're going to be exploring the physics of flight by actually creating a glider. These are like simple hands-on activities which you can do either at home, at school, or at the science center, or wherever you want. Sissa Media Lab also created a set of resources particularly related to the universe for kids, I believe, um, five to eight years old, something along those lines. I'm not totally sure about the age, but we can check as we go on the website. There's some great activities. We've actually used them for events, and uh, the kids love them. I mean, it's space, it inspires them, it's hands-on, they love them. So as you can see, we have quite varied activities. For older kids, we have, as you can see here, fishbowl debates, we have charades games, we have matching games where you have to match the, the, the profile with a photo and trying to guess which profile actually, which person became a scientist to try and tackle certain stereotypes. So quite a few activities. We also launched this event at Slovenia. We have Damiana here who, who, who works at Hisha Experimentov. They had an event where participants were able to meet two people who were featured in the resource pack from Slovenia. And also they went through some of the activities in the resource pack with participants. So as you can see, we have pictures here showing the activities and the participants um, trying them out. So that's it from my end. Before I stop, I'd like to, so I'm not sure if I can do this. I think I can. Yes, I can. So you should be able to see my, my screen right now showing the website, the Ready's website. When you go on the website, you can either sc scroll down and go through all the activities that we've done, or else just go on the menu. You have a list of project activities right here. Erica, are you, are you showing us the website now? It's not showing right now. No, we're see I'm seeing the slide presentation. Yeah, let me try something else. Share screen. Let me know. Can you see this, Jason? Yes, we can now. Awesome. Thank you. Sorry, technical error. Um, so this is the website. Either scroll down, you have all the activities here, or go through the menu. You have the project activities all the activities that we've done up till now. It doesn't include um, workshops such as the ones that we had with NSSS. Most of these are the deliverables of the project. We intend to keep on doing these, but obviously um, we didn't input everything because it would have been too long. But you also have downloadable resources. So you, so you have the literature review, which is literature reviews carried out but by all partner organizations related to VET and STEM carries in their country. This helped um, influence both the app and the resource pack. If you want to find out more about the, the status of VAT in other countries, please feel free to just download them and, and, and go through them. The, I mean, it's quite interesting. We also have the, the stereotyping stereotype resource pack here. This is the one I was showing you, where it's an overview of all the profiles and all the activities. It might take a while to load because it's quite a big so let me duplicate and go through the rest and then below you'll find each and every activity and their um, separate resources you might have certain activities where you just find the the overview of it on the main pack on the main pack i mean by this so if it's charades and it was quite simple to explain what you need to do you'll find it here if it's a bit longer, not to make this resource back to 100 pages long, we have separate um, resources here. So just go through them and you can download everything. Apart from that, we'll be putting the app link on the downloadable resource page as well. So we'll put it here. Um, we'll put the app and currently we're also working on another resource back. So we decided following the virtual career events, 
that uh, it might be so there was still interaction between the kids and the same professionals um, they still got to ask questions they were the interviewees and so the speakers were in the interviewees and the kids were the interviewers they created their own questions and they asked their own questions so the interaction was there but we felt that it might be best if we still give them a resource pack so right now we decided to develop a resource pack related to careerism and um, which we can then disseminate to schools and put on the website so whoever wants to use it can use it and it will feature activities for example if you have a game designer what tools can you use to design a game and actually an activity related to a game design if you have for example an ecologist what does an ecologist do and an activity that an ecologist does maybe featuring some skills or or, or anything that that you know you need for the job and hopefully that will also serve as as a fun activity for kids to do we're well aware that unfortunately at this point in time due to the pandemic we can't really share resources but thanks to project funds we're going to be currently in the process of procuring the kits for kids to use and also developing these activities once the pandemic is over hopefully the teachers will be able not over but once it's a bit you know more control and um, the educators will be able to use it with their kids to raise a bit more awareness on what careers are available in the STEM industry. Um, it's work in progress because as you can imagine, uh, schools had a lot, a lot of things to do and to prepare for. So the webinars had to be postponed to October and we had the last one in November. And we couldn't start developing the resource pack until we had the dates confirmed and until we had the speakers confirmed because now the activities will be directly linked to the speakers of the webinars that way the kids if they met an ecologist now they will be able to do an ecology activity but hopefully they will enjoy them we're very hopeful that's it from my end i'm sorry i took i think longer than i should have um we would love to hear you from you if you use the resources um please let us know which ones you preferred and which ones didn't work. Some activities might not work, it's fine. The aim is to actually try and improve these activities or create new activities. So please let us know. We can only do so if we receive feedback from you. And if you ever come to explore on the future on a career orientation visit, we'll be using some of these, these resources and we would love to hear from you and from the kids to see whether you actually enjoy them. So, Please let us know whether you use them. That's Thank you. Thank you very much, Erica. Wow, that was very insightful. Um, thank you for sharing with us. Thank you, participants and attendees, um, for participating in the polls. Um, I think that has warmed us up to get going and prepare us for the discussion. Um, in fact, we are now going to move on to our panel discussion, which is entitled STEM and Society Perceptions, Challenges and Forecasting. Um, I will be introducing each speaker, um, but then when it's your time to, um, to speak, if possible, for the benefit of everyone else, if you could just um, introduce yourself briefly, um, that would be really great. So today, um, participating with us, we have um, Ms. Fiona Tesi from TechMT. Thank you for joining us. Um, Ms. Bernice De Battista from Lufthansa Technique Malta. Ms. Lorraine Greg Aquilina from National School Support. Ms. Irene Manjon from the STEM Engagement Working Group at Esplora. Ms. Rebecca Buttigieg, who is actually an engineer and a science communicator here at Esplora. And at the end of it all, we will be um, uh, speaking with uh, Mr. Clayton Kutayar, who is the Esplora Deputy Director. Great, so I hope you are all ready um, to uh, carry on discussing this fantastic topic um, that we are discussing and living. And um, my first question for you would be, why STEM? 
And perhaps I would start, um, I don't want to put anyone on, on, under the spotlight, but uh, maybe I could start with you, Irena. Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm Irene Manjan from the STEM engagement team at Esplora, and I'm here on behalf of the STEM engagement working group. Uh, for those who don't know about it, it's uh, a working group um, that consists of, uh, well, Esplora as, as the chair, uh, the University of Malta, MCAST, uh, Ministry of Education, various departments, and the Institute for Education, the National Skills Council, Jobs Plus, and Tech Malta. So we're quite a, a good group there. Uh, and basically we meet to, to discuss um, STEM activities and STEM measures uh, that need to be taken uh, in relation to, to, to various issues we've mentioned here today as well. Um, so uh, in answer to your question, well, why STEM? One could say a lot about that. Um, but basically, um, from our perspective, uh, with children especially, um, STEM, because well, STEM subjects are fun. Uh, and STEM subjects are interesting and STEM subjects take you places. So there's a lot you can do with, uh, with numbers and with building and there's so much, uh, so many activities you can explore. Um, so that is the first reason uh, for STEM. But also of course STEM um, because STEM occupations are on the rise. Uh, we know that by 2025 there will be about 12% 12 12 increase in STEM occupations in the EU alone. Uh, this is even higher in other regions of the world so there will be a lot of occupations a lot of uh, vacancies to fill and we need to find the people to fill them um also these stem jobs are generally better paid than other jobs so this is also a reason why stem but beyond all this um i would say stem um because whether you decide to pursue a career in stem or not because if you're an arts person you're an arts person and it's perfectly fine um but learning STEM subjects will still be beneficial to any child because of the, the skills this child will, will gain uh, through STEM. So there are fundamental skills such as creative problem solving, creative problem solving, um, uh, problem solving with others, so co coordination and communication, logical thinking, all these things come from learning STEM subjects. Uh, and finally, if this is not enough, STEM again, because STEM helps you understand the world. So in, uh, we're going through the, the fourth industrial revolution and technology is expanding in our lives every day more, something that can't be stopped, whether we like it or not. And therefore, um, STEM again will help children and future adults understand how the world functions, basically. So lots of good reasons for STEM. <laughs> so STEM and STEM and STEM again. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Irene. Um, I, you might have, uh, you know, complementing um, uh, answers to that question or opposing. Um, I, I open the floor to you guys um, to, to be able to perhaps expand um, upon what Irene has just uh, mentioned. Feel free to raise your hand or, you know, just come forward um, to, to discuss. If not, we will all, we can move on to, to our next um, question. Um, Hi, no. Oh, sorry. Uh, so, it's all right, it's all right. Who do we have? So, go, go on, Lorraine, it's okay. Okay. And so hello once again, um, yes, I am Lorraine Grecacolina, an education officer within the National School Support Services. Her guidance is one of the remits within, the, within NSSS. And basically our role is to, together with my colleague and with my director, and basically we are a whole team, we have a whole team of practitioners out there. We oversee and we deliver the career guidance service across state uh, colleges in Malta and Gozo. And we liaise obviously with third and independent schools in, in this regard. Um, yes, uh, I fully agree with what Irene Manjon mentioned, such mentions. And in fact, um, I just want to say it up front that our service, the career guidance service, basically was introduced. Um, <coughs> It was introduced a number, a long number of years ago, and um, where we had counsellors, uh, which were who were also working 
on the career aspect. But basically, there was a, a reform around 11 years ago, whereby uh, the education department started recruiting specifically career guidance practitioners. Uh, they work hand in hand with a number of guidance teachers who are based in our schools, but the aim was entirely to give the career guidance perspective and provision to all our students mainly, uh, both within the primary uh, schools and also within secondary. I am, sp speaking, I am speaking about the compulsory context here, the compulsory education context, but not alone. This goes beyond a post-secondary level and also a tertiary level. We light um, regularly with, with heads of schools and our career guidance fellow colleagues within the post-secondary sector and also the tertiary sector. Um, basically, from our perspective, STEM, uh, we keep on defining these four disciplines, which are basically science, technology, engineering, and math. And for us, this has a direct relevance to the curricular subjects which are taught within our schools and also the, uh, the career guidance service um, through which the initiatives complement what is being taught in schools. If I can provide an overview of the curricular subjects which one finds within the STEM sector, we'll see um, the typical sciences most of us are used to, the science, physics, biology, chemistry, but we also have the vocational health and social care, for example, and we also have the applied health and social care subjects. When it comes to the technology discipline, we can see the computing as an academic subject, not a subject directly related to it is the design and technology. We also have the vocational information technology subject together with the applied information technology subject. Also, this has to do with engineering. We also have the vocational engineering technology subject and the applied version of it. Um, while we have also the mathematics, which is, as you well know, a compulsory subject, just like science and physics. Two main differences here. Um, some of the subjects are compulsory, which means, which means that students have to study them. In Maltese, we have this best word, in force. But we need them practically. It is important that these subjects remain compulsory. But on the other hand, we have a number of option subjects, which are mainly what I have the examples which I have mentioned with regards to some subjects, but also a whole list. And basically, what I have to mention is that through the My Journey reform, it was launched um, two years ago as of this holistic year, 2019-2020, the option subject choice exercise was widened in the sense that as, a, as a, an educational curriculum component, we tended to rely heavily on academic subjects which were based purely on theory and then assessment, assessments were made on, on examinations, oral examinations, etc. Um, through the my <coughs> journey, this, this choice of subjects was widened, and that is why you heard me um, stating vocational, for example, and applied. This is because the my journey rests on three pillars, which are the academic pillar, the vocational pillar, and the applied pillar. Um, for the latter, the applied and even the vocational, the thing is that it involves a more hands-on component and, and the more a practical component, both when it comes to the teaching and the curricular content, but also on the assessment. We no longer tell a student who, who chose, for example, a vocational subject or an applied subject, write a composition about or come and sit down for, for a theoretical test. We give them the opportunity uh, to, to make things with their own hands, to practice, to feel, to touch, to, to test, to analyze, to reflect, to think practically. Um, this encompasses a whole number of other skills, as, as Irene also mentioned before. Um, 
this was done mainly because even as educators, we realized that we have to shift from the one size fits all. I, I'm referring to the policy making and the grades here and the policy making level. We had to deviate from a one size fits all to, to focusing on the different learning needs and the learning styles which our students have. Not everyone learns the same way. That is why this, the, the, this opportunity to choose subjects was, was widened. Obviously, although I'm saying very nice words here and mentioning the, the career guidance service, we cannot do this alone, practically from, from, from the office where I am or from schools and behind our desks. If it wasn't for the collaboration with Explora, MCSD, and other entities, I'm noticing we have Bernice here with us today, the respective employers out there, um, who work hand in hand with us, we cannot do the complementation aspect with regards to this curricular um, uh, aim, where basically we, in a nutshell, through the career guidance service, we try to um, make students aware of the relevance of each subject which they learn at school and bridge that with making them identify their, their strengths and think about their abilities and their, uh, and their future career aspirations so that we assist them in developing their own career mapping so that eventually uh, later on in life they will become successful um, employees and they would be happy with the choice uh, that they were they would have made because um, there are challenges that we will see later on associated with what am I, I am saying right now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lorraine. And um, uh, with uh, you know what you've just mentioned, I would like to perhaps um, rope in um, Miss Bernice De Battista here um, to understand um, what is the perception out there of STEM in relation to careers, and perhaps even Miss Fiona Tesi from Tech and T, if you could. Um, you know, give us some light, shed, shed some light on the perception. What is, what is your idea about this? Hi, um, good morning everyone. Um, I'm Fiona from uh, TechMT. Um, uh, basically TechMT, uh, it's a public-private partnership uh, that was established last year between the government of Malta and uh, the Malta Chamber of Commerce and Enterprise. To, to promote Malta as a tech center for innovative technologies. Um, with regards to, to your question, I think the, the initial idea might be that these are limited to, to doctors, scientists, as, astronomers, or maybe engineers, um, but due to, to the creation of new market sectors, actually the, the possibilities have, have also grown. STEM subjects are, are difficult to, to study and why this is the case, uh, the opportunities and the positive changes that come from studying such subjects um, have become endless. So uh, this also puts emphasis on introducing students to, to these subjects as early as possible. Um, also due to the ever-changing progress um, being done in, in the technological industry. Um, the job market is very large and uh, many opportunities actually do exist. But on the other hand, um, the companies need to, to be aware that new graduates also need time uh, to learn on the job, <laughs> to continue learning and improving on what they have actually uh, they have learned or gathered throughout their, their studies. Thank you, Fiona. Um, uh, maybe I can also rope in uh, Ms. Bernice de Battista, um, who is from Lufthansa Technique, Malta. Do you have anything to share with us on this? Well, basically, I believe, uh, yes, careers have been changing, and it's not just graduate engineers that we currently have to focus on because um uh, mainly some engineering areas basically more in aviation also need to have a highlight one because it's 
a growing industry and not a lot of the students go to university. MCAS is doing such a great job in providing these courses and the hands-on experience that they're gaining from MCAS is much more than anything where it's the study that they're studying. But I believe uh, career-wise, it's getting there. People at such a young age, they tell you, yes, I like it, yes, I don't like it. And I believe if you don't feel it, you will never get there. So if they have the passion and they're at heart with it, they will get there no matter what. Thank you very much. Um, uh, what I wanted to perhaps um, uh, mention is, um, coming from industry, um, in your opinion, uh, what stereotypes uh, are associated with STEM? And, and if, if not, we can move on to someone else, don't worry. Well, from our end, I think if they tell you an engineer, some people won't imagine because there's an aircraft engineer. Some people, when they see a plane, for them, a plane is just flying. The idea behind a plane flying really involves uh, maintenance. And uh, it was fun, especially when we were at Explorer, explaining to them, like, when a car goes to a mechanic, the plane goes to a mechanic. So, but there again, we're also promoting the woman in engineering as well. Like Erica said before, it's like, uh, Mikel Zamitla Rosa was one of ours. We, um, the stereotypes need to be focusing more and more. But I must say, times have been changing, it's evolving. There's a lot of guidance to these kids and everything. So, thanks. And mentioning um, engineers, um, I would say we have, um, you know, a, a a walking example here at Esplora, and perhaps I could um, I could take her views as well. I'd like to open uh, Mr. Rebecca Butijic. Hi. Hello. Um, I'm an example of uh, someone who would have benefited from initiatives like this, because when I was in school, no one ever suggested to me I could even be an engineer. I always thought I would have to study physics as a degree. When I was 16, I happened to run into an engineer while I was on holiday. He was a retired engineer driving a boat. And he was telling me what his job in robotics was like. And I was like, oh, you mean this thing that I love to do? I love building things. I can do that as a job and get paid? What? And I went home and I told my parents, I'm switching my degree. And they were like, okay, if you really want to. And the career guidance teachers didn't know what to say to me when I was asking them about my options because um, they weren't really that clued in on the, to the, the new careers coming up. So it's really nice to see the career guidance teachers being so proactive and, and informing themselves of the cutting edge of our, our current our market and where it's heading. But in my experience as an engineer, one of the problems is people don't realize that there are hundreds of kinds of engineers, all different kinds, all different fields. One job I applied for was designing packaging for makeup. You know, <laughs> who knew that that was a thing? And the, the particular job I did for seven years was mostly in doing computer simulations. It was like playing Sudoku for 30 hours a week and getting paid. So there's a, a, a fit for just about everyone in STEM but one of the problems is that both the children and their parents and even sometimes their teachers don't know this huge variety available that almost anyone can plug in somewhere. So projects like this are really great. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I don't know if you have any other, other views about stereotypes and, uh, you know, associations with STEM. Um, you can also, um, you know, write in the chat if, if you, you prefer. Um, perhaps uh, any of our attendees want to pose a question. Um, however, earlier on, uh, um, I believe Fiona mentioned um, something to do with um, these subjects are difficult or hard to, to study. And um, it brings me to the question of um, what skills and competencies would 
would STEM employees need in this day and age? And perhaps, um, I'm not sure if, if you want to agree or disagree with um, that statement put forward. Um, if you, we can have somebody perhaps who hasn't yet, uh, have you all spoken, I believe? Yes, you have so far. So yes, the floor is open um, to whoever wants to, to answer this question. Okay, Lorraine, go ahead. I mean, fine with me, we are here to discuss and I am very eager to share with you um, the perception from the education aspect uh, in this regard. Um, yes, we stress our students the importance of skills, the acquisition of skills, um, employability skills, but not only the whole concept of eventually the transversal skills. We, through the initiatives which we hold, we try to make them, first of all, aware of such skills, the skills which are needed out there. Um, and they, moreover, through their participation within the initiatives, we try to make them instill these skills so that they acquire them in order to um, facilitate eventually their, their um, transition from compulsory schooling or the post-studying path towards the, the employment scenario. Um, basically, we convey the message of the importance of the on-the-job skills, but not only on the job, because we, we know very well, and even employers who we liaise with and who host our students tell us directly that most of them are always willing to train eventually their, their new employees, etc. Um, but also the focus is, goes on the off-the-job skills. And in particular, uh, the, the, the soft skills, which we mention a lot, and uh, like we internally joke among us, uh, they, they are called soft skills, when in reality, um, th these are not soft at all. Um, you cannot tell a student who, who doesn't know how to communicate uh, to, be, to, to become, or an employee. I mean, uh, with regards to yourselves and the employers, employer represent, representatives who we have here, if you have an employee who is not a good communicator, it's not that you put him on a training program and he would become a, an excellent communicator. We all know when it comes to soft skills, and, and various um, interpersonal skills, these are very difficult to, to obtain and achieve. Obviously, um, even through, uh, there's another branch uh, in relation to, to our career guidance service, which is directly related with the curriculum, that is the personal, social, um, career development subject. M most of you know it as the EPS, it has become PSCD, um, from, from a number of years ago, but you, most of you know it as the PSCD, PSD subject. Um, it, it involves uh, a good component of, of a career, uh, career component, uh, whereby we teach our students how to, to acquire and learn about the career management skills, which is the skills that they have to learn about and also to acquire so that they can eventually later on throughout their, their career paths make um, sound and valid decisions. Um, when we, we always convey the message um, about the number of employability skills needed, where basically in a nutshell we can make a whole list such as that employers um, would like flexible employees, they would like responsible employees, committed employees, employees who are team players, and those particularly who can become also leaders, both within personal and also eventually who can go up the career ladder within the company and become also um, part of the management within the company. Employees who can work under pressure, everyone is um, and employees who eventually are and remain motivators. Um, we all know that we spend a, a number, a good number of hours at our places of work. You cannot have 
afford to have um, unhappy employees. Unhappy employees will not deliver as much as happy employees. And these concepts, we try to, to convey them to our students, um, both to group sessions, but also particularly through individual and one-to-one -one sessions where we probe further regarding their, their career mapping and their career aspirations, etc. We hold many exercises whereby first they list their career aspirations and their preferences, and then hold one-to-one -one sessions which, with each student, and even, and even follow up sessions. Basically, we guide them through the, the years of secondary schooling so that um, they, try to acquire these skills and also um, clear their ideas as they, as they grow older. Um, mainly before we aim at, at uh, trying to reach this before they finish compulsory schooling. Obviously, I know that that is not always the case. We face many challenges because as I said later on, skills, it, they don't only come from, from the educational context or from school. We know that families play a major role um, someone before already mentioned the parental involvement and reaching parents. Um, Erica mentioned, I believe, but I'm sure that all of us agree with this idea. Um, so it's important because there is a whole collective collaboration when it comes to, to instilling students the, the acquisition of such skills. Thanks again, Lorraine, um, for um, being so generous and, and sharing um, you know, um, all this information with us. Um, so, uh, well, we, we all agree that, um, uh, from what you've been saying, that um, there are challenges out there and perhaps uh, you can share with us what are these challenges within the STEM sector. Um, for example, um, uh, my colleagues here um, at Esplora, um, meet a lot of um, children and families and um, I'm sure they have conversed with them many a times. I'm not sure whether this comes up in any conversation if you want to share with us and similarly um, from industry um, if you can share you know your views about this. Um, yes uh, as you well said yes there are a number of challenges um, I can start off with mentioning that there is um, lack of students who take up um, STEM subjects. This is the message which we even you convey. But unfortunately, I have to say that this shortage or, or lack of option um, at nowadays is across the board. Uh, it is common across all sectors. I mean, nowadays, so today we're holding a webinar with yourself. Um, but when we speak to employee representatives out there, they all tell us this common thing. We have a shortage, shortage, shortage. Please promote, please make students aware, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that is one big challenge for us um, when trying to organize activities. Um, because we are trying to promote all sectors because all sectors are needed. Yes, there might be... Um, direct interest in various sectors more than others at times, but such as nursing, for example, during the COVID period, etc. cetera. Um, but for us, it remains a challenge to try to include um, these career guidance initiatives within the school timetable, because the school timetable, based on the curricular, curricular aspect, is already limited and tight in itself. Um, Another thing, uh, which is a challenge for our practitioners, is that it is not easy at all to try to widen the perception of students who might be narrow-minded. At times, no matter how much we try to, to make a student challenge his narrow idea or to, to deviate from remaining stuck, with a certain career path, for example, because he still, has, he still has to grow older and he has to explore and he has to reflect, et cetera, et cetera. At times, yes, it is a challenge that students might um, not be so open to deviate from that stereotypical idea. Needless to say, this doesn't hinder us from 
something going working and challenging. And the key today here, I believe, is that we we have no everyone has challenges, but we have to keep on focusing on our work and basically on raising the awareness and promoting um, sectors, particularly as we are saying the, the STEM um, sectors and stuff. One aspect I would like to mention is that um, even high flyers at times, the high academic achievers, um, they are so bombarded with career opportunities that at times it wouldn't be easy for them to, to choose. I wouldn't say right away because we don't like the idea of students choosing right away. But at times we have the students who, who achieve set grades, very good set grades, but since there are a lot of opportunities, then this made them uh, have a more complicated process in a way. But once again, our practitioners hold as many one-to-one -one sessions um, as, as uh, needed in order for students to clear their ideas um, further on. Um, and parents, this is the challenge that I would like to mention, not to take uh, most of the That's time. That's right. um, For us, uh, dealing with minors, this is the major distinction between us within education and perhaps employer representatives and other entities out there. We deal within compulsory education, we deal with 16 year olds um, and, and, and lower, I mean, age bracket. And for us, we cannot just, for example, in this COVID period, yes, we right away want uh, new that we have to transfer our operations and our service towards um, an, an online version of each aspect. But uh, it's not easy. It is a challenge because uh, we couldn't afford practitioners sending MS Teams invites as a platform. We use the MS Teams within the education. Um, we cannot just let our practitioners send uh, an invite for an online meeting to hold a one-to-one -one session. Guidelines have to be developed and disseminated to our practitioners. We have we had to safeguard our practitioners who will be like on their own holding an on the one on um, a one-to-one -one session, and they will be practically exposed to. We should not forget that during the COVID period, a lot of work went on. A lot of work. I mean, not to say even more work. Um, went on when everyone was working within their homes. Okay, there are setting background background effects, etc. But still, the issue remained with having one practitioner holding an online session with a minor. So guidelines and the respective consent. We have um, support documentation which supports the service itself in order for it to be delivered. Um, so yes, uh, there again, in these instances, we had to um, call parents to be on board so that they would provide their consent, ideally be present when the practitioner does these sessions, um, and basically um, supervise what is going on too. And also, why not provide us with feedback? We hold feedback exercises because it is from there only. I mean, our students and parents are the major stakeholders. Um, so we want to learn what we are doing um, good, we are eager to hear and we like to be complimented, but on the other hand, we would like to, to um, wear their shoes and see what we can do better and how we can um, improve our service in order to reach every single student within, within each, every single household out there, irrespective of the baggage, whether it is supportive towards education, curriculum, initiatives, and all the aspects we're mentioning here, but not, not forgetting those households who cannot afford or who cannot promote such context to their, to their students. This is our crucial role in here. Uh, we, we try to identify these, these limited um, cases and we support as much as we support the high achievers and those who are willing to, to venture into STEM careers and all, and all other careers, basically. Very interesting uh, point uh, you've mentioned there um, uh, amongst uh, the pressing challenges um, that are faced. 
Um, I believe uh, Rebecca would like to, to mention something, so I will um, give the mic to her. Thank you. I think that one of the huge challenges that we face in STEM industries is that we have jobs today that didn't exist 10 or 15 years ago, so the teachers couldn't really prepare, have that job in mind to prepare the kids for. We don't, we're teaching kids today and we don't know what jobs are going to exist in 10 years. We know we're preparing them for jobs that don't exist. And that's really hard for educators and, and guidance counselors and all that. However, it's a, it's a very old problem that our job sectors have shifted so dramatically, but our education system hasn't quite shifted with it. Even 10 years ago, I was facing problems with junior engineers graduating from university with excellent academic results, but no problem solving skills. And in the workplace, your boss says, you know, it is, we'll tell a technician, the machine's broken, fix it. That's all you get, it's fix it. And then you have to not only have the technical knowledge, you have to have the creativity to track down the problem, to figure out a way to solve it. Maybe the part isn't gonna get here for three weeks and your factory can't afford to shut down for three weeks because that one machine is going to hold up the line you have to find a way to fix it but our schools uh, our school system was in the past very you know here's the curriculum here's some knowledge learn the points and then we'll send you off and it's encouraging to see this this that the education system in Malta is trying to shift but I think it needs to shift a lot more and bear in mind that the jobs that these kids are going to have in 10 years time they don't exist but what the kids, we know they will need problem solving skills. They know we, they know they will need the creativity. I did a career show for some middle schoolers a few years ago. Half of them wanted to be Twitch streamers. If you don't know what Twitch is and you're working in this sector, then you have a problem because Twitch is what a lot of the kids like to watch. They want to be like Ninja. If you don't know who Ninja is, you can't really talk to them. A lot of kids that they're fixated on Fortnite. I started playing Fortnite so I could have a common language with them. And they go, the boys go nuts when they, oh, what, a grown up plays Fortnite and she's a girl, what? And they really want to talk to me about it. But how many of those boys know they can have a career coding games? That if they go into IT and they learn how to code, they can create games. How exciting is that? Who wouldn't want to do that? But if we, if we don't have the vision and the wherewithal now to speak the language and set them on this path, I think we're missing out on these opportunities. Very exciting. <laughs> if your job could be coding games, uh, and um, which, you know, um, I've, I've noticed that here at Esplora, um, we do start um, at a young age and um, trying to introduce things like coding to them. And I'd like to pose the question to you um, whether. Uh, STEM and early years go hand in hand together, how important it is, uh, how important it is um, to start building up, building them um, to, to eventually um, choose STEM careers. And then after that, um, I would like to ask as well, do we have to segregate STEM and STEAM, which means if I'm an artist, can I be a scientist? And if I'm a scientist, can I be an artist? Can I be creative? I'd like to, you know, to get the discussion going in, the, in this direction. So, um, yes, we'll start with the early years. Um, who would like to, to share something about that? I wouldn't mind sharing an anecdote if you, if yes. you will allow for a story. I don't know. It, we wouldn't remember, but in 1959, there was a British physicist and novelist who famously delivered a, a lecture. He was C.P. Snow, and he, he uh, described a post-war schism between two groups. And he said, there are the scientists and the literary people, and these don't get along. And um, he, he uh, identified this as a newly emergent divide uh, across which uh, every party was more than happy to sneer at the other, basically. So you had the scientists uh, proudly saying that they couldn't quote a phrase of Shakespeare, uh, a verse of Shakespeare, and the literary types who were untroubled by the second law of thermodynamics, and they didn't care not to know what it was. So um, these divisions, unfortunately, still exist, uh, and are still 
uh, deeply entrenched. And today we have a, a, another um, problem that compounds the situation, which is populism and um, the, the conspiracy theories that are unfortunately making science unpopular <laughs> rather than popular. Um, so uh, what, what I mean to get to here is that the A in STEAM um, is not necessarily only about performing science in performing arts. The A in STEAM also stands for um, um, ethical issues and, and, and emotions such as empathy, which are also required in STEM occupations. Um, in fact, the EU is insisting a lot on responsible research and innovation, um, bringing in elements from the social sciences and humanities uh, into, into science disciplines. Um, so teaching empathy, ethics and citizenship, uh, even in, in STEM um, subjects, um, is extremely important. And of course, from the early years on, um, we know that um, STEM uh, learning in the early years is extremely beneficial to, uh, to our youngest uh, children because of the fact that it makes them ask questions, basically. Um, um, recently, I, I talked to a little child, who, um, a four-year-old, who told me that his teacher had given him a sticker after school. And I said, oh, great, why did you get a sticker? And he said, I got a sticker because I usually ask too many questions and today I didn't ask as many questions. And I thought that was the saddest thing <laughs> a child ever told me in a school context because it is obviously the opposite that we want. We want the teacher to give him a sticker for asking lots and lots of questions because inqui being inquisitive is ultimately what will um, lead to being a critical thinker later on as well. So, um, yeah, these were just some thoughts I wanted to share with regard to your questions. Thanks for sharing, Irene. That's, uh, that's fantastic. Um, yes, uh, which um, in the meantime, till, you know, um, whoever wants to share, wants to share, you reminded me as well of um, myself. Um, being young, I, I, um, I was more inclined, um, you know, to be an arts person. Um, I did choose um, at secondary level um, science subjects, um, but I felt that I was, uh, as a person, more, you know, I could adapt better, um, I could perhaps understand better um, art subjects and, you know, perform better coming from the performing arts world. And um, when I was living abroad, um, one day I was just watching television and there was this program, something similar to Art Attack, if, if you know what these programs are, but it was a science TV program. And um, they explained the, the ticker tape uh, experiment by actually showing something real and, and really big and bombastic. And I was like, oh, if only when I was young and I was studying physics, which I had to and eventually passed, but I could make, you know, the learning part of what I was learning um, more realistic and who knows, perhaps I could have utilized more um, my science subjects into what I was doing. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that um, many years later now, um, thanks to initiatives like Explora and, you know, what you've mentioned, the guidance teachers, um, people in industry, um, we've got representatives here. I'm hoping that since that time we've moved on and, and um, perhaps, um, you know, focus on honing more at the earlier when, you know, people are really forming themselves because um, we don't necessarily want them, you know, um, you need to become a scientist, you know, but at least um, give them the possibility and the options and, and, um, and learn to, to understand what, what, what is out there. And of course, as guardians and parents, we have the responsibility to, to you know, even by visiting um, somewhere, you know, just exposing our, you know, younger ones to, to endless possibilities. And um, we mentioned the soft skills earlier on, um, you know, how to problem solve. I mean, it would come in handy any, any, anywhere, you know. So um, before you, we mentioned the obligatory um, subjects, which, which are very important, but also um, 
the obligatory subjects need to be perhaps taught more in the context in in real you know everyday life and this is what i i see happening here at esplora and and of course i'm sure you have many examples and even the attendees here i'm sure you know you have many examples um, of of what i'm i'm mentioning here so um uh, any of the panelists, um, uh, I think Fiona perhaps would like to, to mention something? Yes, um, I think actually arts are um, an integral part of, of the work as a whole and the arts program might engage more students. Um, it promotes creativity, I think, and even maybe reduce high school dropouts. Um, uh, the importance to the arts in, in this case does not mean that um, uh, less should be dedicated to, to STEM subjects, but maybe rather it is about sparking students' um, imagination and helping students innovate to, to hands-on uh, STEM projects, maybe. Um, um, in conclusion, I think that uh, STEAM might be the reason to, to bring about a change in the engagement number of students taking up such subjects as a career prospect. Yes. If I may. Mm -hmm. Sorry. It's okay. Go ahead, Derek. If I may, I think another issue is um, some favor of educators agreement. If we're talking about the arts in, in schools, especially the old, uh, when you go into middle school and secondary school time is always an issue because i don't think it's that educators don't want to for example um teach a particular concept to drama i think it's just because they don't have enough time to actually do that there are a lot of creative teachers who can do a lot of creative things with their students but if teaching a concept by by i don't know doing a demonstration is quicker than than I don't know, organizing a whole performance, then automatically they will have to resort to that simply because they don't have enough time. You can't blame them. I have friends of mine who work at St. Paul's Missionary College right now. They're actually they making an effort of including the arts. Um, so they, they actually applied for funds for a project and they included science teachers, drama teachers, um, design and technology to merge arts and sciences together to create um, a performance with other schools from other countries but this is these are things that will take place after school during holidays and weekends so again they want to do it but automatically obviously they can't take up too much time from their lessons because they are limited already so obviously at the end of the day much you can't have a, a syllabus or a curriculum which is too flexible because at the end of the day the exams being a formative or a summative way or whatever you want to assess subjects they're always going to be there so they can be flexible a bit more flexible but again they're limited by assessments and time yes Elena I think I saw you Yes, uh, but that is uh, what you're saying is obviously true. But I think, as I said before, beyond uh, teaching um, science and technology and engineering mathematics through um, arts, uh, which is great if it can be done within the time constraints, there is still the issue that you, even if you don't, uh, if you can't do that, you can at least bring in some teachings from social sciences and humanities within the STEM um, curriculum itself. Uh, yes, definitely. And particularly um, when it comes to, to, to ethical uh, considerations which are better taught via the arts than via pure uh, physics or <laughs> obviously and this is extremely important because the scientists uh, and engineers of the future uh, will have to deal with some very very complex and they already have to, uh, ethical issues such as um, software algorithms and how far we can go um, germline uh, editing um, you know it, it's uh, it, there are a lot of very what was that you mentioned just uh, now sorry <laughs> uh, well there are algorithms that are used for example even in criminal sentencing for example you know, the, which is a mathematical calculation, uh, which uh, the outcome of which will result in criminal sentencing. For example, it is a, mm -hmm. it is a, a very uh, complex thing to design, 
uh, if you do not have the right ethical considerations behind the design uh, of this concept, obviously uh, it could be extremely dangerous. <laughs> and there are other examples like these uh, in, in other domains in organ design, which is, uh, uh, for example, uh, a future uh, um, STEM career. Uh, it might be a future STEM career, it already is actually, but uh, it, it is developing. So that's why um, it is important to bring in certain teachings from, from the humanities and from social scientists mm -hmm. within the, the, the teaching of, of STEM subjects at, a, at a, in an early stage, so that by the time these people um, go out into a STEM job, they have the right ethical framework to be able to tackle certain very complex situations, even in regard to climate change, for example. Uh, whether geoengineering is the right solution to climate change uh, is, a, is, a, is an issue at the moment. So you need the people out there to have been taught already in their, um, in their student years what is acceptable uh, to do to the planet <laughs> and what is not, you know? So it's, uh, it's, mm -hmm. there are some very complex issues, but that are much better taught um, via, via arts. Very, very conscientious uh, remarks there uh, made by Irene. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, you did mention um, future STEM occupations, and I would like this to be perhaps our last question um, that we, we will address together and perhaps have a round. Um, what are the STEM occupations that are forecasted for the near future? Um, and we can, you know, wrap um, this session by um, looking into the forecast careers and then move on to Clayton. Any? I think the, the job market um, of, the, of the future requires flexibility and innovation. Creative thinkers, I think it was mentioned below by, by most of you. Um, uh, communication, skills um, that are embedded within all art forms. I think it is a bit difficult to, to know exactly uh, what kind of jobs or career parts will exist in the next 10 years uh, due to the rapid advancement in, in, in technology. But uh, with the innovative addition to, uh, to STEM, the, the arts part, I think options have continued to grow and one can be a designer, um, a digital artist, a scientist, and an engineer all, all at the same time, I think. And be cool and fashionable <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> Rebecca? I actually cheated a bit and did some research about uh, this question in advance because I wasn't really sure what to say. One thing that really struck me was we're seeing the rise of artificial intelligence. Um, already on, on a lot of websites or Facebook pages, you meet chatbots, for example, that um, talk to you as though you were, as though they were um, aware, because they're programmed to respond to your basic questions, like, is this product in stock, or, or when, they, when you're opening hours. Um, and so one thing that I found regarding future occupations is, if you have a lot of artificial intelligence, you need to teach it. So we're going to need educators who specialize in educating artificial intelligences. Thank you, Rebecca. We do have a comment from uh, Silvana Gauci, um, who is sharing with us that she perfectly agrees with Irene. Um, we do take, tackle ethical issues and communication in design and technology education through design and make projects. But there again, we are also limited by assessment and time. Um, this seems to be recurring, I think, all, all the time, but I think it will always be an issue. And um, we would need to perhaps, you know, um, even in, in, uh, in the real life, you know, when, when you are, you're out there, you're, you're always um, limited with, with the time, with efficiency and effectiveness. Um, on the job. So I think this, this issue of time will be present always. Um, so that would need to be tackled from, you know, all aspects. Um, so we, so Fiona has given her a response, Rebecca, um, Bernice? Well, I tend to agree with Rebecca. 
um, artificial intelligence is taking a big part. So career-wise, um, there might be more changes and everything. And I believe also this COVID thing made us realize how digital and technology we can start working as well. So some careers might be molded and affected to be adapted to the new norm. And I think we never knew this is going to happen. We won't know what's going to happen in 10 years time. But I think we might have new concepts of engineering and stuff which will focus on these things. And perhaps uh, lastly, um, Lorraine, would you like to share something with us? I think you're on mute. Okay, 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 we got you now. Okay, now? Okay. Yes. Um, basically, this was the question where I uh, like turn to my fellow colleagues here because we are at the receiving end as, as educators and as career guidance practitioners we're always willing to know more about um, which careers are being forecasted, which would be needed, et cetera, et cetera, which careers are, uh, and sectors are developing, emerging, et cetera. So basically what I can say is that, as we have mentioned before, yes, time remains limited. And we refer to directly within the curriculum where basically yes, Time is very limited and timetables because a lesson is practically not more than 40 minutes. But that is where our service comes into play because through our extracurricular initiatives, which go on even um, within the, the school hours from, from 8.30 till 2.30, but not um, only within those hours, but beyond, um, the need for us um, to collaborate together to convey and exchange these messages and the, the, the ongoing needs um, which emerge from time to time, uh, it calls for us to collaborate, come up with, with ideas, how we can work together. We are blessed now, we have learned more with COVID, that we don't only need face-to-face -face interventions, but we con can consider highly online options. Um, we remain willing to, to collaborate so as to pass on and disseminate any time of information, news, etc., to our students and practitioners. And basically, uh, if I may, <laughs> I, I would like to tell you what Frant, Clayton, uh, Maria, all the team basically, yourselves, I look forward to, to meeting you so that we can look into the, the initiatives which you have mentioned earlier on, the de-stereotyping, et cetera. There are a number, all of the initiatives are good. The app, basically. And I would like you to, if I may use the word, use us. We are at your disposal. We are at the, at the service of our students and parents. So the more that we can be pivots so that you can reach them, we facilitate that process. Here we are. We're only a phone call away. We can meet up, we discuss, and, and we're here to help. Fantastic. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for your participation in this panel discussion. Um, um, I believe in the short time that we had, we have um, tackled um, various issues and ideas, and I hope that all the attendees who joined us um, today found this useful and who will be watching us later via Facebook will find this very useful as well. So on behalf of the Molda Council for Science and Technology, I really would like to thank you um, for your participation. I, um, from my end, I enjoyed also uh, moderating um, this discussion and comparing this seminar and I look forward to other um, opportunities and other seminars whereby we will be able to discuss such topics further. But now I would like to um, give the floor to um, our colleague and Deputy Director of Esplora Interactive Science Center, Clayton Kutayar, to be able to close um, this seminar um, today. Thank you.
Thank you, Giselle. Um, I won't be taking long. Um, I, obviously, I want to thank everyone, not only Lorraine and the National School Support Services, which um, they collaborate with us a lot, and the panelists. And I also obviously wanted to thank Maria and Erika, who have been crucial for this project. It was, uh, I still remember, I just told Erika a couple of minutes ago um, when we were applying for this project, we had even gone and met with Lorraine to, uh, to inform her about the career cafes, etc. Um, and they also wanted to thank Irene uh, um, uh, uh, because of all the work that she's doing in relation to the STEM engagement working group. Um, uh, two remarks from my end. One of the one of them is that at Esplora we are we are not the experts um, in everything. We are only a hub, and we welcome everyone and all entities who would want to also use us and collaborate with us so that we take our views forward in relation to promoting STEM careers, promoting uh, the STEM together with the arts, and also um, to ultimately change the public perception um, uh, of, of these fields and uh, such employment. Um, with regards to the activities, um, uh, we will be raising more awareness on this and these will be available. Whoever would like to collect one from Explorer or even send us an email and we'll be glad to um, email to you. We'll also be circulating the circular to schools. Um, and uh, we would like also to do uh, more webinars or career cafes even to parents and guardians so that we have everything uh, tackled or, or at least whatever we can tackle. Um, with regards to conclude this, my own opinion is that um, this whatever we've been discussing it requires a bit of a long-term strategy in relation to it's changing a mindset and changing a culture ultimately. And people who like me uh, or perhaps older, the difficulty is in unlearning uh, what we learned throughout our school years and throughout our life. So um, this coupled with the advancements of technology, uh, the rapid advancements like Fiona said, then it leaves adults uh, in a position where uh, they need to really catch up with what's happening with what's available out there and they need to unlearn and relearn fast so it's not easy um, it requires a long-term strategy and it requires everyone to work together um, so we welcome anyone who would like to work with us uh, to just contact us and um, we will do the same and thank you Giselle for moderating this um, in a very good way like usual have a good have a good day. Up to you, Giselle, to conclude. Right. So, thank you once again. Thank you for um, joining us. Um, thank you for sharing so much information. After all, we are here to um, better this world we live in. And what would a world be without the world of science and arts? Thank you. And good.